ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ايها الاحبه امسيه طيبه وعلى حضات مباركة نعيشها على مائدة كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه المجالس أيها الأحبة مجالس العلم هي أفضل العبادات وأجلها وأعظمها أجرا وأكثرها ثوابا عند الله عز وجل تتنزل عليها السكينة تغشاها الرحمة تحفها الملائكة ويذكرها الله عز وجل في من عنده فأسر الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل اجتماعنا اجتماعا مرحوما وتفرقنا تفرقا معصوما وأن لا يجعل فينا ولا منا شقيا ولا محروما وبعد شكر الله عز وجل أشكر الإخوة القائمين على هذا المسجد على ترتيب مثل هذه الدروس العلمية واللقاءات العلمية والمجالس العلمية التي يستفيد منها إخوانهم ما جاء في كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهذه الصفة صفة الصلاة هذه الصفة كتبها عالم جليل ابن القيم لا حاجة إلى ذكر شيء من ترجمته وسيرته معروف لدى الجميع ويكفي أنه أبرز تلامذة شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية رحمه الله وكتبه نافعة ومشهود لها بالتحقيق والإتقان والبحث في حكم كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأسرار الشريعة ومقاصدها والوصول إلى مراد الله ومراد رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى ألف كتابا كبيرا اسمه كتاب الصلاة وبناه على عشرة أسئلة هذا الكتاب كتاب الصلاة بناه على عشرة أسئلة حكم تارك الصلاة حكم فعل حكم تأخير الصلاة عن وقتها حكم فعل صلاة الليل بالنهار فعل صلاة النهار بالليل حكم صلاة الجماعة إلى آخر ما ذكره رحمه الله تعالى في نهاية هذا الكتاب الكبير عقد فصلا هذا الفصل لخص فيه صفة صلاة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال خذ صفة صلاة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من التكبير إلى التسليم وهذا هو الذي نريد بإذن الله عز وجل أن نقرأه في هذه الأمسية الطيبة المباركة و يعني انت يسر ايضا نعطيهم اجازه بالسند لابن القيم ان شاء الله ابن القيم نعم انا عندي اجازه الكتب ابن القيم اذا تيسر ان شاء الله نعطيهم بالسند اجازه In the name of Allah the most merciful the one who bestows mercy after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings we praise him for this beautiful evening and these blessed moments in which we will sit on the table of the Quran and the Sunnah And these are gatherings of knowledge. And gatherings of knowledge 
are the greatest and most virtuous acts of worship. And they are those gatherings which contain the most reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in these types of gatherings, uh, sakina, tranquility, descends from Allah subhanahu wa And his mercy it covers the people. And the angels, they lower their wings for those who attend these gatherings. And Allah subhanahu wa makes mention of the attendees of these gatherings with those who are with him amongst the angels. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this coming together of ours, this congregation of ours, a congregation of mercy. And that when we leave, he keeps us all protected as we are leaving. And that he does not make anybody from amongst us to be amongst the wretched and those who do not attain the mercy of Allah. After thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for facilitating this gathering, I would like to thank the brothers who are managing this masjid for organizing this sitting and similar sittings and lessons in which knowledge is studied. And the benefit behind these gatherings is that brothers can come together and they can learn the Qur'an and the Sunnah. As for this treatise, Sifatul Salah, the description of the Salah, this treatise was, was authored by a great virtuous scholar, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyah rahimahullah. And Ibn al-Qayyim has no need for an introduction or a biography because he's known to all. And it is sufficient as a virtue of Ibn al-Qayyim that he is from the most prominent students of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. And the books of Ibn al-Qayyim are well known and beneficial and they are very precise in how he would write and author. And his books are characterized with searching into the wisdoms behind the rulings of the Sharia. Ah and the secrets and the asrar, the wisdoms and the treasures of the sharia ah, and also the maqasid, the intended objectives and primary goals of the sharia ah, and also for the reader to arrive at that which Allah subhanahu wa intends and that which the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intended. This treatise, Sifatul Salah, this is a small treatise which is part of a larger book which he wrote. And this large book which he wrote is known as Kitab salah And Kitab salah is a big volume. This book, Kitab salah the book of Salah, he based it on 10 questions. The whole book is based upon 10 questions. Like what is the ruling of the person who abandons the Salah? What is the ruling of a person who delays the Salah until his time has exited? What is the ruling of a person who prayed Salat al-Layl in the daytime? Or prayed the prayers of the day at night time? What is the ruling of a person who did not attend Salat al-Jama'ah, the congregation? And so on. Ten questions that he based Kitab al-Salah upon. At the end of this bigger book, he mentions a small chapter and in this chapter Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he summarizes the salah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam describing how the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to pray and he says that take the salah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as i've described beginning with the takbir allahu akbar to the taslim and it is this chapter which we will be reading and studying throughout these lessons. هذه الصفة ولله الحمد سبق شرحتها واستدللت عليها وذكرت ما ثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأثار الصحابة رضي الله تعالى عنهم فيها. إن شاء الله سأبعث لأبي العباس نسخة كترونية من هذا الشرح اللي سبقا شرحتها في دروس في بلدنا وجمعت وطبعت وتناولها كثير من أهل العلم فإن شاء الله سأبحث للشيخ نسخة إلكترونية من أراد أن يستفيد منها يقول ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى فصل فهك 
سياق صلاته صلى الله عليه وسلم الخذ سياق صلاته صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه الصفة الحقيقة طويلة هي لكن سنحاول أن نختصر ومن أراد أن يتوسع في الأدلة فسأرسل الشرح إلى الشيخ بإذن الله عز وجل يقول فهاك سياق صلاته صلى الله عليه وسلم من حين استقباله القبلة وقوله الله أكبر إلى سلامه كأنك تشاهده عيانا ثم اختر لنفسك بعد ما شئت هنا في هذه الجملة أراد الشيخ أن يبين صفة صلاة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما جاء في سنته من التكبير إلى التسليم وقوله ثم اقتل نفسك بعد ما شئت يعني خذ بما دلت عليه السنة قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قام إلى الصلاة واستقبل القبلة ووقف في مصلاه رفع يديه إلى فروع أذنيه واستقبل بأصابعه القبلة ونشرها في هذه الجملة بيّن الشيخ رحمه الله تعالى ما يتعلق القيام ركن استقبال قبلة شرط قال لك ثم رفع يديه نعم ثم رفع يديه رفع الأيدي في الصلاة الذي ثبت ثبت له أربعة مواضع ثلاثة في الصحيحين وواحد في البخاري الموضع الأول عند تكبيرة الإحرام إذا أردت أن تكبر للإحرام الموضع الثاني الموضع الثاني عند تكبيرة الركوع الموضع الثالث عند الرفع من الركوع وهذه الثلاثة في الصحيحين من حديث ابن عمر وغير ذلك والموضع الرابع والأخير إذا قام المسلم من التشاهد الأول أيضا رفع الأيدي قال لك الشيخ إلى فروع الأذنين هذه إحدى الصفة إحدى الصفتين ورد صفتان ثابتتان الصفة الأولى أن ترفع إلى فروع الأذنين أعالي الأذنين والصفة الثانية أن ترفع إلى حذو المنكبين تارة تارة وهذه قاعدة ذكرها شيخ الإسلام تيمية رحمه الله وهي أن العبادات التي وردت على وجوه متنوعة تارة يفعل هكذا وتارة يفعل هكذا تارة ترفع إلى حذو المنكبين وتارة ترفع إلى فروع الأذنين وقال الشيخ رحمه الله تعالى واستقبل بأصابعه القبلة ونشرها يعني ما تكون مضمومة هكذا وإنما هي منشورة نعم And this treatise, Sifatul Salah, I previously taught this treatise in our country, and I mentioned the various evidences for each point from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this explanation of mine, it was transcribed and it became widespread in our country, and many of the ulama also read it, and it has been uh, printed and I will send a PDF electronic version of this copy to Abu Abbas and whoever would like it then they can read from it in more detail the author Rahimullah Ibn Al-Qayyim he begins with the sub chapter he said this is a complete description of the Salah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as I mentioned a complete description and therefore the text it is lengthy and we will try to summarize the explanation of this text. Otherwise, whoever wants to go into more detail, they can read from the electronic copy of the explanation which the Sheikh taught. The author said, this is a complete description of the Prophet's Salah from the moment he would face the Qibla and him saying, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest to his Taslim. Of course, facing the Qibla, this is from the shurut of a salah. This is from the conditions of the salah, I, that which has to be fulfilled before a person enters into the salah. And when the author said, Fahaka, here is a complete description, meaning take the description of the prayer of the Prophet wasallam, along with it evidences from the sunnah. And then the author said, 
beginning with him saying Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, to his taslim, as if you are watching him with your eyes. And after knowing this, choose for yourself what you want. The author, rahimullah, he said, when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would stand for salah and face the qibla, standing in his place of prayer, he would raise his hands to the level of his ears and his fingers, i.e. his palm, would be facing the qibla and he would spread, spread his fingers and he would say, Allahu Akbar. With regards to the raising of the hands, there are four positions in the salah in which the hands are to be raised when saying Allahu Akbar. Four, four positions. Three of these are in the Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim. And one of these positions has been narrated by Al-Bukhari. Firstly, Takbiratul Ihram. When a person says Allahu Akbar to begin the Salah, to open the Salah, he raises his hands. Secondly, before a person goes into Ruku. Thirdly, after a person or whilst a person is rising up from the Ruku, he also raises his hands. These three positions, raising your hands for Takbiratul Ihram, before going to Ruku and whilst raising up from Ruku, these are found in the Sahihain of Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar and other Sahaba. And then the fourth one, the hadith was narrated in Bukhari only, and that is when a person stands up from the first tashahud, i.e. the second rak'ah after making tashahud, when a person stands up, he says Allahu Akbar, and he also raises his hands. The author, rahimullah, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would raise his hands to the level of his ears, the edge of his ears. And the meaning of the level or the edge of his ears, i.e. the upper edge of his ears or the upper level of his ears, he would raise his hands. And this is one description of how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would raise his hands. There is also another description and that is that he would raise his hands to the level of his shoulders. So both of these have been narrated, either to the level of the ears or to the level of the shoulders. And there is a general principle which Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah mentions, and that is when a particular ibadah has been performed by the Prophet wasallam with differing positions or differing descriptions, the sunnah is for a person to sometimes perform it one way and sometimes a person performs it the other way. And this is a qaida, a general principle when it comes to ibadat that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam performed in various ways or descriptions. So the full complete sunnah would be sometimes when you raise your hands, you raise them to the level of your ears and sometimes when you raise your hands, you raise them to the level of your shoulders. And then the author said, and he would face the qibla with his fingers, meaning the palms of his hands would also be facing the qibla. And the author said, wa nasharaha, he would spread his fingers, meaning he would not clasp his fingers like this, rather he would spread his fingers and straighten them out. ثم يقول الله أكبر قال وهذا اللفظ هو المجزئ لو لو أتى بلفظ آخر فإن هذا لا يجزئ لأن هذا هو الذي داوم عليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من فرضية الصلاة إلى أن توفي عليه الصلاة والسلام وهكذا خلفاؤه وصاحبته من بعده قال ولم يكن يقول قبل ذلك نويت أن أصلي إلى آخره يعني يقول الشيخ رحمه الله تعالى لم يكن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن يصلي يقول نويت أن أصلي الظهر أربع ركعات أو المغرب ثلاث ركعات أو العصر أربع ركعات قال هذا لم يكن من هدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ولو فعله النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ولو مرة واحدة لنقل إلينا فإن الصحابة رضي الله تعالى عنهم نقلوا أقوال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وحركاته في الصلاة حتى اضطراب لحيته نقلوه ومع ذلك ما نقلوا 
أنه كان يقول نويت تتلفظ بالنية فالتلفظ بالنية هذا أمر محدث لم يكن عليه هدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا صحابته النية هذه من أعمال القلوب وليست من أعمال الجوارح فلا يشرع وإنما يكفي أن ينوي بقلبه نعم And then the author said وقال الله أكبر and he would say الله أكبر الله is the greatest and it is only this wording الله أكبر which is sufficient in terms of salah so a person is not permitted to begin the salah with any other wording and this is because this was the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the time in which the salah was first legislated until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away he never began his salah with any other wording except Allahu Akbar and like this the khulafa and like this the sahaba uh, the companions and then the author said that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam he never used to say before Allahu Akbar I make an intention to pray such and such salah facing the qibla for rak'at at the prescribed time of the obligatory salah performing it for Allah the most high as an imam or behind the imam meaning that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam he never used to verbalize the niyyah the intention he would never say four rak'at for dhuhr three rak'at for maghrib four rak'at for asr and so on and so forth rather it was something which was intended in his heart and the author mentions how the sahaba how they conveyed from the salah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam all his statements every single statement of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has been conveyed by the companions and his actions and his movements even how his beard would move in the salah so despite them narrating from the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam every minor detail of his statements and his actions and the movement of his beard however never once has it been narrated that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to verbalize the niyyah or pronounce the niyyah and this therefore shows us that a person verbalizing the niyyah pronouncing the niyyah this is something which has been innovated it is muhdath it is an innovation or a bid'ah because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not do this action and neither did the sahaba do this action so the niyyah the intention min a'mal al it is from the actions of the heart the niyyah is not from the action of the limbs and therefore it is sufficient for a person to make this niyyah in his heart and he does not pronounce or verbalize the niyyah this bali raf al aydi kama dhakarna raf al aydi tara tarfa hadha al mankibayn tara tarfa ila furu' al udni mata tarfa alladhi dallat lahu al sunnah أن المسلم يرفع يديه ثم يكبر ترفع يديك هكذا الله أكبر أو ترفع يديك إلى فروع الذنين الله أكبر ما جاء أن مسلم كان يكبر قبل الرفع أو يرفع قبل التكبير هذا كله لم يثبت الثابت أنه كان يرفع يديه فإذا استقرت في محل المحادات قال الله أكبر ترفع يديك الله أكبر أو ترفع إلى فرع لذينيك الله أكبر هذا هو الثابت قال الشيخ ثم يمسك بشماله بيمينه فيضعهما فوق فيضعها فوق المفصل ثم يضعهم على صدر بعدما تكبر تقبض اليمين بالشمال وقد ورد له صفتان ورد له صفتان كما في حيث سهل وحيث وائل بن حجر رضي الله تعالى عن جميع الجميع الصفة الأولى الوضع دون القبض الصفة الأولى الوضع والصفة الثانية أن تقبض من عند المفصل الصفة الأولى أن تضع والصفة الثانية أن تقبض ويكون وضع اليدين هو قال كالشيخ على صدره هذا ما ثبت لفظه على صدره اللي ثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما في حي سهل بن سعد تحت الصدر تحت الصدر يعني إيه فتضع اليد اليمنى على الكف اليسرى وعلى المفصل 
أو تقبض تحت الصدر وعلى هذا يكون الوضع هذا من قبيل السنن التي وردت على وجوه متنوعة تارة تضع وتارة تقبض And with regards to raising your hands when you say the takbir, when does a person raise his hands? And that which is found and established in the sunnah is that a person first raises his hands and then he says, Allahu Akbar. So a person raises his hands to his shoulders and when they are to the level of his shoulders, then he says, Allahu Akbar. Or a person raises his hands to the ears and when, when they are at the level of the ears, then a person says, Allahu Akbar. As for the other views of a person saying the takbir first and then raising his hand second or after saying it, then this has not been established from the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After this, the author said that he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, would then hold his left hand with his right hand holding it at the joint of the wrist. And this is known as Al-Qabd, holding. And there are also two descriptions of how the Prophet wasallam would hold his hands. And that is, either he would place his right hand on his left hand, i.e. placing it without grasping or holding it. And the second description is that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would hold the left hand at the wrist and then place it uh, at the chest. So this is what has been established. There are two descriptions of holding the hands. Either that you place the right hand on the left hand or on the wrist or you hold the wrist with your right hand and both of them are authentically established in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the author said, ثُمَّ يَضَعَهَا عَلَى صَدْرِهِ Then he would place them on his chest. The, the wording of the author that the Prophet ﷺ would place them on his chest, the wording ala on his chest is not authentically narrated. Rather, that which is authentically narrated is that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed them under the chest. And this is from the hadith of Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu an. That the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would place them under his chest. And so the placing of the hands on the, the right, on the left is from the sunan. From the encouraged actions of the salah. ثُمَّ بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ يَأْتِي بِدُعَاءِ الْإِسْتِفْتَاحِ ودعاء الاستفتاح ورد له صيغ متعينة متعددة وقد ذكرها المؤلف رحمه الله المؤلف ذكر جملة من صيغ الاستفتاح وكما سبق أن ذكرنا في القاعدة التي ذكرها ابن تيمية تارة يأتي بهذا وتارة يأتي بهذا تارة يأتي باستفتاح سبحانك اللهم ربنا وبحمدك وتبارك اسمك وتعالى جدك إلى قره أو باستفتاح بهريرة في الصحيحين اللهم بعد بيني وبين خطاياي كما بعدت بين المشرق والمغرب اللهم نقني من خطاياي كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس اللهم اغسلني من خطاياي بالماء والثلج والبرد أو تأتي يأتي بالاستفتاح الحمد لله حمد كثير طيب مبارك فيه أو يأتي بقول الله أكبر كبيرة والحمد لله كثيرة وسبحان الله بكرة واصي إلى آخره هناك عدة استفتاحات وردت للصلاة في ينبغي لطالب العلم طالب العلم ينبغي له أن يحفظ شيئا من هذه الاستفتاحات وإن شاء الله أنا سأرسل هذه ذكرتنا هذه الصيغ ما صح عنها عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنا سأرسلها للشيخ بإذن الله عز وجل ينشرها بين أيديكم وما كان من استفتاحات طويلة فإنها تكون في صلاة الله يعني الاستفتاحات الطويلة مثل قال لك الشيخ نعم سبحانك اللهم ربنا وبحمدك اللهم بعد بيني وبيني نعم وجهت وجهي إلى آخره هذا يكون في صلاة الليل نعم وربما كان يقول الله أكبر كبيرة إلى آخر أول الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا أنت إلى آخره المهم نفهم أن صيغ الاستفتاحات متعددة 
وبعض العلماء أفردها أفردها بمؤلف مستقل فيستحب لطالب العلم أنه تارة يأتي بهذه الصيغة عموما المصلي حتى وإن لم يكن طالب العلم لأنه إذا نوع يكون هذا عمل بالسنة كلها هذا من وجه وثانيا فيه حياة لهذه العبادة لأنه إذا داوم على صفة واحدة أصبحت كالعادة لكن إذا كان تارة يأتي بهذه الصفة وتارة يأتي بهذه الصفة كان في هذا حياة لهذه العبادة وثالثا أنه ما ينسى يحفظ العلم نعم. And then after this the author he mentioned the supplications a person should say after he has begun the salah and these supplications are known as dua ul istiftah dua ul istiftah and again there are many variations which have been narrated from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the author has mentioned some of them from the authentic ahadith like he's saying subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa tabaraka ismuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayru glorified are you o allah and by your praise blessed is your name elevated is your majesty there's none deserving of worship except you and sometimes the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayaya kama ba'atha bayna al-mashriq wal maghrib to the end of the dhikr oh allah distance between me and my sins as you have distanced between the east and the west to the end of the dhikr and sometimes the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say allahu akbar kabira allahu akbar kabira to the end of the dhikr oh allah Oh Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Praise is for Allah in abundance to the end of the dhikr. And there are many other variations of this dua, dua al-istiftah, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make. In fact, they are more, they are so many in number that some of the ulama wrote a whole book regarding dua al-istiftah and the various supplications that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make. And again, in the explanation which I have, which has been transcribed, I've mentioned the various uh, different supplications that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make, and I will send them to you. So the point is that it is recommended for a talib al-ilm to memorize as many of these supplications which he can do so, and then he alternates between them. In fact, for every Muslim, every Muslim, tries to memorize as many supplications as they can and then vary, varies between the supplications. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And in doing so, there are three main benefits. The first benefit in alternating between the various du'as and supplications is that a person is implementing the whole sunnah as opposed to only one sunnah, which is one supplication. So in alternating between these du'as, you are implementing the complete sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he used to alternate between the supplications. Secondly, because by alternating and varying the supplications of Dua al-Istiftah, your, your ibadah, it, it becomes alive. If a person only sticks to one Dua al-Istiftah and he always repeats the same Dua again and again, after a while, it will become a ritual, just a routine, a practice which a person is doing without, without much thought. But when a person varies and alternates between one supplication and the other supplication, then this gives a greater depth and a greater meaning to the ibadah of a person. And then the third benefit is that you are preserving knowledge. You are preserving the sunnah and you are preserving the knowledge of the various supplications which have been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In addition to this, some of the more lengthier du'as, like, وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ To the end of this supplication, then perhaps this was restricted to Qiyam layl To the night prayer, he would lengthen the supplications. Now we'll take a break now for Salat al-Maghrib. And then we'll uh, start immediately after the Sunnah prayers.